this series is probably the most important series that I've ever touched on, ever. And uh, we, I'm not going to repeat all last week, but I'm going to just draw a couple of uh, reference points to set the stage for where we're going today. So the title today is Lord or Lord. Is he Lord or is he Lord? And we discussed last week that most people uh, in our culture, in our, in our generation, this part of the world, we think of Jesus as Savior. In fact, we use the word Savior in our culture more than we use the word Lord. But if you look in the Bible and you count the number of times the word Savior is used as opposed to the number of times the word Lord is used, the word Lord outnumbers Savior about five times. The emphasis is not on Savior. The emphasis is on Lord. Now, when we say that, we touched last week, we also touched on the fact that being a Savior is what he does. Uh, savior is not who he is. Being, I'm going to say that again. Being a Savior, he is Savior. That is what he does. Uh, but, but who he is, is Lord. Now, in our lives, we can make him Lord by way of a title, or we can make him Lord by way of position. There's a big difference in that. A lot of people make him Lord by way of title, but they've never made him Lord in their lives by way of position. Does that make sense? We can give titles to people, but their title is powerless until we give them the position. You see, we can call people the CEO or, or, or uh, CFO or whatever it is, but if if they don't have the position, the title means nothing. All it is is a name on a business card, but it's the position that brings the power and the authority behind the title. Jesus illustrated it this way. Jesus says, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now remember, last week we touched on the fact that this is used twice. He says, Lord, Lord. And when anything is repeated in the Bible, it's because the writer is emphasizing it. Jesus, when he is saying this, he's emphasizing the word Lord. So he says that not everyone who says to me, and, and when he emphasizes it in the original, it is something like this. Not everybody that, that says to me, Lord, Lord, you're the Lord. Not everybody that says that to me will enter the kingdom of heaven because what they are saying is, your title, your title, you're the Lord. But, you're, but they're not saying that you're my Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that, that's sobering if you ask me because there are a lot of people today across America sitting in church going in worship. They're lifting their hands and they're going, Lord, Lord, Lord. But they, he is not their Lord. They're worshiping a title. They're not worshiping a position. Jesus went on to say, he said that, he said that some, will, will, some will say, have we not prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done great miracles in in your name. They're justifying themselves and in, in some ways rightfully so. Haven't we done these things in your name? You see, we can operate and use his name as a title and command authority. Great things can happen in his name as a title. But Jesus brings it a level deeper, and he says to me, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. You've used my name, and you've used my authority, but I truly have never known you. You had access to my title, but you never accessed my position. Let me tell you something that is even more sobering to me. I can preach every Sunday. I can preach with great inspiration. I can preach with the anointing of the Holy Spirit 
and walk out of here and still not make him the Lord of my life because I'm accessing the power within the name, but I am not giving the person with the name the position in my life. Don't ever be fooled by greatness in the kingdom of God. Don't ever be fooled by great preachers and messages and, and whatnot, because that does not mean that Jesus Christ is truly the Lord within their life. I can live a sinful life and stand up here and wax eloquent and God will anoint his word. Why? Because it is his word and he's anointing it regardless of my sinful condition. That's why preachers keep preaching while they're having affairs. Preachers keep preaching while they're stealing the offerings and they're embezzling. And one day they get caught and the world stands by and says, how could he have done that for those many years and we've listened to him every Sunday or we tuned him in on the TV channel or the radio channel and he was so anointed. Meanwhile, he's sleeping with the lady in the front row and his wife doesn't know it. How could he do that, Pastor? Because he's exercising, Lord, the title. But he's never brought it, Lord, the position into his life. Let me break it down this way. <coughs> Years ago, uh, I proposed to Deborah, and thankfully she said yes. <coughs> Greatest thing that ever happened to her. It's Father's Day. I, I, get, I get one, right? <laughs> but think for a minute. Young guy is dating this beautiful uh, girl, woman. And she's smart and she's articulate. And uh, she's a great cook. And uh, he's so impressed with her. He's just, he, he, he's just head over heels in love with this girl, and he, he decides one day, he says, I, I, I'm going to propose to her. Uh, this is the woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with. There's no doubt about it. There's nobody else that can compare to her. So he takes her to a fine restaurant, and, and, uh, and he, uh, he decides he's going he's gonna to pop the question, and, and he waits till that right moment. Dinner is... They, they, they finish dinner and the, the waiter is bringing dessert. He's got the ring in his pocket and, and he decides to do it the most romantic way he can and he gets out and he gets on one knee and, and he goes, Sally, I, I want you, I just want, I want to ask you to marry me. And he opens and he has the ring. And she screams out in the restaurant, yes, 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 oh, man, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And she takes the ring, she goes, thank you, thank you, thank you, I love you. So they're eating dessert now. And he's going, wow, this is the happiest day of my life. And they're eating dessert. And, and uh, as they're finishing dessert, she, she says to him, she says, uh, uh, John, I just have one thing to tell you. And he goes, what's, what's that? I forgot, what was her name, Sally? Sally. Sally. <clears throat> he goes, what's that, Sally? And she says, well, John, she says, uh, I'm, I'm dating a few other men. I've got, I've got uh, Harry, Rick, and Carlos, and, and, uh, and Juan, and, and we, we see each other regularly, and I'd like to continue to see them. Uh, to which John goes, John goes, uh, no, I don't think that's going to work. You see, I'm asking you to marry me, and uh, if you say yes, uh, you're giving yourself only to me, and I'm giving myself only to you. And she, so she, she, she's taken back, like, what's wrong with you? So she thinks about it, and she says, well, all right, well, let's, let's be adults, let's be adults, and let's compromise. I, I, I won't see Carlos and, and, and the other two guys I'm just going to see, I'm just going to see Ricky, uh, and, and that's all, one guy. And to which, to which John says, he's getting horrified now. He's saying, my God, what did I do? And he says, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, I, I can't live with that. So she goes, no, oh, geez, you're so hard to please, John. Come on, lighten up. Uh, she said, I love you with all my heart. Man, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, but come on, you know, I mean, 
do you gotta do you gotta claim everything? So she said, How's this? Okay, 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 John, okay. I'm only going to see him one day a year. Just one, you get 364 and he gets one. To which John goes, oh, that's not going to work either. So in her last attempt, she goes, John, I can't do better than this. I'll see him half a day, one day a year. To which John says, I think you should give me back my ring. Uh, because you're just not getting it. Now, now, when we look at the story like this, we would say, what, what would happen if John would have agreed to that? Well, you and, I, you and I would say, well, John is a chump, man. You know, she got over on him. What kind of a chump? Is he that desperate? John's just a chump. Well, that, well let, let, let's, let's put that in a heavenly realm now. You see, the Bible likens our relationship to Christ, it likens it to marriage. And if we expect that to be okay with Jesus, then what are we calling Jesus ultimately a chump? Well, he's just a chump. He's good with anything. You mean, so when we look at her, it's obvious, what is obvious is she's not willing to give John her entire heart. She's not willing to sell out and give it all. It, she's drawing conditions. She's setting lines in the sand. Well, I'll give you this, but I won't give you that. Well, I'll give you my life, but I'll only go so far with it. After all, I got to hold a little something back for me. I can't sell out. I can't give you everything. And yet John is there willing to give it all, but she's not willing to reciprocate but she wants the benefits of the marriage anyway. Next week, we're going to talk about gold diggers. <laughs> she wants the benefits, but she's not willing to give herself completely uh, to John. Matthew chapter 8, verse 34 and verse 35, Jesus made it very clear. Jesus said, whoever desires to come after me, whoever wants to come after me, he said, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. The cross was a sign of death. Let him take up his cross and follow me. See, there are a lot of people that want to follow Christ but they don't want to deny themselves, and they never want to take up their cross. And they just want to follow him on their own terms. But Jesus said, that's not how it works. If you're going to follow me, this is how it works. This is the only way it works. If you're going to follow me, you deny yourself. In other words, it's not about you. It becomes about me, because you are following me. I'm not following you. You're following me. It, it's about me. So you deny you to follow me. We're, we're not going your way, and we're not going to argue about which way to go. There's no tug of war. <clears throat> if you're going to follow me, you follow me. You give up of yourself, and you follow me. And then he says, and we're going to take it a step further, uh, you pick up your cross. You, you die to you. You pick up your cross, you die to you. I wonder how many believers die to them. I wonder how many believers die to themselves. I wonder how many believers, they, they don't even know what that means. They think, are you kidding? What's he talking about, die to myself? Isn't it all about me? Haven't I come to the church that's the bless me church? Tell me how I'm going to get blessed all the time. I don't, I don't want to talk about dying to myself. Tell me I'm going to get money, I'm going to get a car, I'm going to get a house. Tell me all the things I'm going to get. Don't tell me what I have to give up. Don't go there, pastor. You tell me what I have to give, give up, I'm going to go to another church that's going to tell me what I'm going to get. Because that's all about getting. It's not about giving and giving up. I, I wonder how many people, I, I wonder how many people today, if God said, if God said, see that guy across the room, doesn't have a car, give him your car. I wonder how many people would actually do that. 
can have mine, but you can have the note with it. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> I wonder how many people that God said, you know, you got $100 in your pocket. You see the lady behind you that can't put groceries uh, in the refrigerator this week, give her the turn around, give her the hundred dollars right now. I wonder, I wonder if God said that. How many people would actually do that, or if they'd reason in their mind, get behind me, Satan? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't do things like that, and, and 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 find every reason not to do it. Jesus said, Jesus said, you got to deny yourself, and you've got to pick up your cross if you're going to follow me. For whoever whoever desires to save his life. Whoever desires to save his life, underline the word desire. Whoever desires to save his life, whoever desires to save his life, you will lose it. What? You will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, he will save it. The word desire is an interesting word used there because what Jesus is saying, he's saying that if you start to follow me, but your desire is to always save you, it, if, if you're going to start to follow me, but your desire is to always save you, you will end up actually losing you. He likened it another way. He said, any man that puts his hands to the plow, but he keeps looking back. What have I left? And should I go back to it? He said, you are not fit for the kingdom. Those two parables go together. So if I start to follow Christ, but my desires are always do what I want to do for Scott, and it's all about me, and that's the desire of my heart, is to save my life, he said, in the end, you will actually lose it. But if you come to me and you give me all of your life, in the end, you will gain it. Now, now after this parable, the, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, we have given everything to follow you. In essence, they were saying, we've given you everything. What, 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 tell us more, please. Don't leave us with that. And Jesus said, you've given everything, but you are going to be given families and possessions and stuff, not only in the kingdom to come, but in this life also God will take care of you. That's what happens when you give of all of yourself. You open a door for God to give back. Now, mind you, you're not giving all of yourself to get anything. You're giving all of yourself because he is Lord, and that's what it costs to follow him. <clears throat> what he gives back, what he gets back is a side benefit. Now, if he don't give anything back, you have no reason to complain because he is Lord and you are a servant. You, you don't have... You, people that pray for stuff and make demands on God turn my stomach. You don't have a right to demand anything. You have a right to stand on God's word because it is his word and not yours. That's your right. You have a right to expect it because he said it. But aside from that, you don't have any rights. Servants do not go to their master and make demands. They don't say, well, I'll cook your dinner and I'll wash your clothes and I'll clean your house. However, I got to have Mondays off and I want Wednesday afternoon off because I watch Oprah. And on Saturday, I, I want off because I, I'm going to go out of town. i got to get some me time. How many of you know that the master would say, then you're not my servant. Get out of my house. Because the servant has no rights. <clears throat> so Jesus is saying, he, he who, who, who wants, desires to, to, to save his life, always looking back you'll end up losing it. Now, those aren't my words. Those are his words. But, but the person that's willing to lose his life, in the end, will save it. Back in the day when I became a Christian, this is back in another generation. I don't know. Our generation today is, they just believe that everything is owed them. 
But in my generation, when we came to Christ, we called it selling out. That's the, that's the term we use. Are you going to sell out for Jesus? And if you weren't going to sell out for Jesus, don't waste your time because he wasn't interested. We all sold out. We gave of ourselves. We gave of whatever we had. Whatever he asked for, we were willing to do. It was no longer Scott controlling Scott. It was how do I serve the Lord and how do I sell out? In James chapter 4 and verse 4, James says, James says, he calls the Christians, he said, you adulterers. Y'all are a bunch of adulterers. I didn't say that, James did. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I'll say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. So going back to the marriage, going back to the marriage where the Bible says that the relationship with Christ is, is a type of marriage, <clears throat> going back to the marriage, can I tell you something? If Deborah started running around with some guys in the church, Number one, those guys would be dead. <clears throat> I believe people will put money on my books. I'm going to shoot you first. And then can I tell you something else? As much as I love Deborah, I think she's going to be dead too. Because she has become an enemy of everything that I have lived for. For the 30 years we've been married, she's become an enemy of that. And, 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 and I know people forgive and people get over, but I don't believe that there is a person that honestly loves their mate that if and when that ever happens, that at some point, given the option to do them in, they would. So people say, you know, I'm just going to give Jesus some, uh, but I'm going to keep some. I'm not going to sell out completely. I'll show up on Sunday. I may do something for the church. I may do a little something because it makes me feel good, but I'm not completely selling out for God. Jesus said, I'd rather you were hot or cold, but lukewarm does me no good. Iced coffee tastes good and hot coffee tastes good, but lukewarm coffee, ugh, I'll just pour it out. You see, we as churches, we've softened the message. Some of you after today, you're not going to like me. And uh, that's the risk I'm running right now. Because you don't like the way it makes you feel. Because it puts you in a position where you have to make a decision. You see, churches to grow, you, you have to make the message palatable. Uh, you have to make the message to where it makes people feel really good. Because they're going to walk away opening their mail tomorrow, hoping there's a check in there because you said that they're going to prosper, and they're going to this, and they're going to that. In fact, churches today, they soften their worship. They soften their message. It's called uh, being friendly, seeker-friendly. Oh, this is wrong with that. I'm not opposed to that. We do some seeker-friendly stuff right here. We play some music that's not Christian once in a while. I'm okay. I like it. Don't want to do that every Sunday. But when you start denying the lordship of Christ and he becomes savior only, I think the church has missed the mark. You see, we, we invite people to accept Jesus. We don't say, 
I'm inviting you to accept him as your Lord. We say, would you like to accept him as your Savior? Would you like to accept only what he does, not accepting who he is? Let, let's just get saved so you know that you're going to heaven, you've got a little insurance in your pocket, and, 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 and hopefully he's going to bless you in some ways that your life is going to be better. Let, let's just get saved and uh, let's be okay with that. Jesus doesn't save unless he's Lord. He, you, you can't take what he does without making him, giving him rightful place for who he is. Don't kid yourself. Re remember, there were those people that cast out demons that prophesied and did miracles and they came to a rude awakening when he said, you've done all these things in my name, but I'd never known you. I have never been Lord in your life. I don't know you. Depart from me. Get away from me. I don't know you. So there are people today walking around with a false sense of security but have never made him Lord in their life. And there's going to come a day when you and I are going to stand in front of him and he's going to ask, was I your Lord? And you can say, Lord, Lord. And he'll respond one of two ways. Either I knew you or I never knew you. Depart from me. Well, only one of two ways. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many people you pray for. It doesn't matter how many prophetic words you come up with. It doesn't matter the miracle services you do. None of that matters because he's not impressed with that. He's only impressed with whether I'm your Lord. Because if I'm your Lord, I know you. But if I'm not your Lord, depart from me. I never knew you. <clears throat> Churches today are focused only on the numbers. How do you get people in? How do you keep them once they come in? It's called how do you shut the back door so they don't come in and go out? How do you keep them coming? Visit two, visit three, visit four. They keep records. They hire people. They have staff people to track it to make sure they're getting with those and so that they're being brought in. I don't know. I, 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 I like it. If we had a budget, we might do some of that. But, but there is a part of me that says he's not that concerned about the numbers. He didn't go out to build numbers. He built disciples. And to be a disciple meant, by the very name, disciple meant you followed the rabbi. What the rabbi did, you did. You, the, the wording in the original language is you followed so close that the dust that the rabbi kicked up as he walked became your very dust. You look dirty because you were following so close. In fact, when the numbers got a little high and Jesus felt that they were only following him for the free food and the miracles, he turned around and he gave them the most darkest, deepest message imaginable. And they all left. No, we ain't going to do that. That man's a lunatic. We're leaving. And the crowd left him. He never once chased him, them or changed his message. In fact, he turned to the 12 disciples. He said, are you going to leave too? And they said, where would we go? We have nothing to go back to, remember? Because when they made a decision to follow him, they sold out. Yes. There was nothing to go back to. There was no life to go back to. They sold out. They go, we can't go back to anything. We sold out for you. We have to follow you to the end now. There's no other place to go. But those that didn't sell out, Jesus made sure that they would stop following him. Why? Why? Because in the kingdom, they're a waste of time. They're living a false sense of security, and Jesus doesn't operate that way. He's not interested in how many people will follow him. He's interested in who will make him Lord. 
I'll tell you this. All of the stuff that you hear preached, all of the good stuff, the life-changing stuff, doesn't happen until you make him Lord. I'd be lying to you if I told you it did. Will you just sit in church every Sunday and you'll get over that addiction or you'll get over that problem or you'll get over on this and you'll get over on that. A year later, you're sitting in church going, how come I haven't? Have you lied to me? It's when you make him Lord that he takes control and when he takes control, stuff begins to happen. And many times it happens really quick because he moves fast. He doesn't play and he doesn't waste time. He doesn't dilly-dally. He's focused on your life. And when you give him the rightful place of Lord, oh my gosh, stand back, get out of the way because stuff's going to happen like you cannot believe. Miracles happen. Life-changing stuff happens. Yes. Empowerment happens. His strength becomes your strength. Yes. His character begins to overpower your dysfunctional character. And now you've got character you never had before. Your yes becomes a yes, and your no becomes a no. Yes. There's so many people in the church... You don't believe a word they say because their word means nothing. They're no different than the world. What does that say? It's because they've never made him Lord. Mark chapter 10. I'm going to leave you with one more thing. If I want it. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. This is about the saddest parable, second saddest parable in the entire New Testament. Now as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? Now your Bible, if you look at the heading, it will say parable of the young rich ruler. Now this man is a young rich ruler. He's very, very wealthy. We don't know how wealthy it is, but because the writer here denotes the fact that he is young and he is wealthy, has got to tell us that he's probably one of the wealthiest people in the city. He drives the Cadillac of chariots. He wears, see, somebody's already throwing stuff at me. It just didn't make it up to the front row. <coughs> He wears Armani suits. He totes around a Rolex. He's wealthy. Money is not an object to him, but he realizes there's something missing in his life, and he's been listening to Jesus from a distance, and, and, and the Bible says, the writer here says, that as Jesus is going down the road, he says that one, one came running, I mean, this guy's hooping. He's sprinting. He's, he's, he, man, he's got to get to Jesus. He comes running, and he, and he comes flying down on his knees before Jesus. And he goes, good teacher. Man, what do I got to do to be saved? He is sincere. He's earnest. He's run. We don't know how far. He slid on his knees. He's got his Armani suit knees all tore up. He's a little dirty. He's not used to that. But he's so desperate. He's desperate. Tell me what I need. got to tell me what I need. I, I need to know. What, what do I do to be saved? Tell me, Jesus. To which Jesus responds. He knows that this man is religious. And Jesus responds. He says, he says I'm going to take you back to what does the Bible say. And, and, and it's interesting that the man, when he comes to Jesus, he calls him good teacher. He doesn't call him Lord. The reason he calls him good teacher is he says, in all of my desperation, as desperate as I am, I'm making you only a teacher because no matter what you tell me, I can take or leave it. 
But if I dare call you Lord, then whatever you tell me, I have to take it. I have to accept it because I've just called you Lord. So he, he comes running to Jesus and he goes, good teacher, good teacher. What do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus says to him, in verse 19 and 20, he says, well, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And the man responds, he says, he says, he says, teacher, all of these things I've kept from my youth. All these things I've kept from my youth. It's interesting that Jesus starts with the sixth to the tenth commandment. He never recites the first commandments. He doesn't recite the first four commandments. He only recites the last six commandments. Because the last six deals with relationship with others. And the man says, I've kept perfect relationship with others. I've not murdered. I've not stealed. I've not bore false witness. I've done all of these things. I've honored my father and mother. But Jesus never drew him to the first four. Because the first four commandments deal with your relationship with God. I think if he would have fell on his knees and said, Lord, tell me what I have to do, Jesus would have directed him to the first four. But as teacher, he only directed him to the last six. To which the man said, I've done that perfectly. I've done it all. What are, what are the first commandments in the first set of four? You shall have no other gods before me. Oh, here's one. Here's one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Well, wait a minute. You mean that was an Old Testament commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart? All? Oh, he wants, he wants all of your heart? Well, no, 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 no. God, I want to love Deborah with 60% of my heart, uh, but I really want to live Jill with 20 and Susie with the other 20. And I gave her most of my heart. That ain't the way it works. She'll love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And you will have no other gods before me. I'm the one. I'm the only one. <clears throat> the text goes on in verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, notice these words. He loved him. He loved him, and he said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up your cross and follow me. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Only he didn't say deny yourself. What he did was he told him how to deny himself, sell everything you have. That's denying yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Why does the writer point out the fact that looking at him, he loved him? The writer makes sure we know that. Before downloading on him, before Jesus downloads on him and lays the condition, Jesus looks at him and the writer says that he looking at him, he loved him. Here's why. Because Jesus loved him too much to not tell him the truth. Jesus loved him too much to not tell him the truth. Jesus loved him too much than to give him a false sense of security. Jesus loved him too much. Man's eternity is at stake. I'm going to tell him the honest of God truth. The Bible says, but the rich 
young ruler was sad at his word. And he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, the man's having riches was not the problem. The problem was the place those riches had in his heart. Jesus is not making a, a, a slam against wealth at all. But he's addressing an issue to where it had in this young man's heart. You see, have no other gods before me. Apparently Jesus looked at him and looking into his heart, he could see that the money had become his God. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Jesus could see in his heart that he didn't look, he couldn't love God with all of his heart because he loved his money too much. There wasn't room in his heart to love God with all of his heart. He only had a little compartment for God called Savior. Just save me. Tell me how I can have eternal life. That's all I want. But I have no more room in my heart because the rest of my heart is in love with my stuff. How do we know that Jesus saw this in him? Because when Jesus told him that, the man walked away sorrowful. Jesus read his heart and he walked away. He could not do it. He walked away sorrowful. And then the writer goes on to tell us because he had great possessions. They meant too much to him. They meant more to him than God could ever mean. I wonder if Deborah would have married me if when we were dating, I spent all my time with my car. I had a really nice car back then. I wonder if she would have married me if every waking moment I was in, in the garage tinkering with my car. I mean, it was... When we first met, I had a... 48 suicide door, it was slam, pearl white, velvet velour interior. Man, I was low riding, I was cool. But that car, don't even touch my car. And you had to have special permission to even ride in it. But I wonder if that car, if every night I was out there, we ate dinner and I said, thank you honey, I'll catch you Kitchen in the morning, you go to bed. And I went out there and I just polishing my car and I love my car and, and, and I'd go for cruises on Saturday and leave her at home. I wonder if she would have married me. Because I, I think she would respond. I think she would say, I think you love your car more than me. There's no room for me in your life. It's all about your car. See, that's what, that was the condition of this rich boy's heart. He had, he had no room for any other God than the God he had made in his heart and that he loved. And he walked away sorrowful. You know, I thought about this, this story. And uh, I thought, what would happen today if that happened? What would happen today? What would happen if a man walked into church and all of a sudden somebody recognized him and said, man, that dude, that dude's, CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I wonder how the church would respond. I wonder if we'd all be wanting to take him to lunch and make sure he got bought into what we were doing because after all, he's going to probably fund it to some degree, right? I, 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 do, you, do, you, do, you know, do you know that there are churches today that, and I'm, again, this is no slam. I'm, I, I, we'd probably do it if we could afford it with the right heart, of course, but there are churches today that hire staff that track people's giving, and the people that are the heavy givers, they're assigned to stay in contact with them all the time to make sure that they take them to lunch and they take them to dinner, they pat them on the back so that they feel needed. Did you know that? There are staff positions that do that. But I wonder if somebody came in wealthy and uh, we were just like, woo, man. I wonder if God spoke to our heart and said, 
their wealth is their God. I am not their Lord. I wonder if we'd have the courage to tell them. Sir, you're headed for a rude awakening one day when you stand before God. Please don't give us any money because that's your God. We serve a Lord Jesus Christ. And we only want you to give if he's your Lord. And because he's not, uh, please don't give us any money. No, we won't take that check for this. You can, you can keep it. And he gets offended and he leaves and says, oh, I'm going to go down to another church where I'm appreciated. Most churches would take him in and make him head of the deacon board. But you know, it's interesting. Jesus never chased the young man. Jesus never chased him. Jesus never said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's look at this in the scheme of things. You know, the Bible says that if you give, you're going to reap. And, you know, I'm just asking you to give a little bit because you're going to reap and you're going to get some more. You're going to get a lot more pressed down, shaking together, running over your cup. You're going to get more. I mean, this is the, the, the kingdom economy, you know, economics here. And, and try, to, try to dummy the message down. Jesus never chased him. Jesus said, as long as that is God in your life, I can't be your Lord. You might as well leave because you can't serve me. Didn't the Bible say you can't serve two masters? You'll hate one and love the other, or you'll love the one and hate the other. You can't serve two. You have to have a made-up mind. Is he Lord in title, or is he Lord of my life? If he is not Lord of your life, Please don't expect to reap half the stuff I preach because it ain't happening. It ain't, you, you, you have a false sense of security. Things are going to go all good for you. It ain't happening. It only happens when he becomes Lord of your life. Amen?